The record will reflect the presence of counsel, the defendant, and the jury. Mr. Barker, you may call your next witness. We'll confirm that. So, Detective, you were previously sworn earlier in the trial. Do you understand you're still under oath? I do, Your Honor. All right. Thank you. You may proceed, Mr. Barker. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, You've already stated your name, Lauren Nagel. You spelled that before, so we'll skip over that. Um, tell us about your background. What, uh, what led you to this position? Sure. So I attended Northern Arizona University. I received two bachelor's degrees. I have one in criminology and criminal justice and one in sociology. I graduated there in 2014. And that same year, I was hired by the Coconino County Sheriff's Office. When I began the, at the sheriff's office, I was assigned as a deputy sheriff in the Grand Canyon Williams District. And then in about 2018, I was promoted to detective in the criminal investigations unit, and that's where I work now. All right, thank you. And you, were, you are what's called a case agent for this case, that's, is that right? Yes. And explain what that means. It's kind of just like another way of saying lead detective. Uh, typically, it's assigned by whoever's on call when a call comes out, and in this case, I was. And then, uh, so basically working the investigation from the beginning all the way until the end, being the lead detective, over, kind of overseeing the investigation and requesting other detectives' assistance when needed and that kind of thing. All right. So we've heard from other detectives in the case, uh, Tristan Meyer, we've heard from Lieutenant uh, Lurkins today. And they would all be operating kind of under your, not supervision, but guidance. Is that right? Somewhat. We, we really do work as a team, but I am the lead investigator on the case. All right. Um, and does that mean all the information kind of flows through you? Yes. All right. Now, talk about how you were assigned this case. When did that happen? On January 18th of 2020, I was assigned to be the on-call detective for that day. Sometime around 4 p.m., I received a call from Deputy Luna, who notified me that a deceased woman had been found out in the forest. Um, he was able to explain a little bit of the reporting party's report, but I did have difficulty speaking with him. He had arrived on scene, the phone service was bad. So just based on what I had heard, I decided to respond to the scene. All right, and did you go immediately there? I did. And describe for the jury what you found. So when I first arrived, I noticed that there was sort of a fork in the road. We had a National Park Service ranger parked there. The, the forks was FS-545, as you've heard, and FS-244. I noticed that the responding officers had been parked on FS-244, so that's the road that I drove down. Once I got there, Deputy Luna and maybe some of the other officers on scene, there was Forest Service and National Park Service on scene, they walked me to where the deceased person had been found. All right, let's go. To, <clears throat> we, we've shown these before, but there are a couple maps showing that area. Let me reference those so we can be reminded what they look like. This is 149. The red marker is where Sasha's body was. Yes, yeah, so there, it, it's typical in the county, there's often multiple names for a road. I see this map shows the number 395. I referred to it as FS Forest Service 545 and SEV may have called it Loop Road. I think that Lieutenant Lurkins also <laughs> referred to it as uh, Sunset Crater Road. So again, there's multiple names for it, but I will refer to it as Forest Service 545. Suffice it to say, it's all the same. 
Yes, it's all the same road. It's a paved road. Yes, it's it's a loop road. Um, it's kind of like if you think of a backwards C. Well, you'd enter it. There's two different entrances from the same highway, which is Highway 89. Okay, I'll try the laser pointer here. I don't think we can see the northern entrance on this photo, but it looks to be this is about the southern entrance from Highway 89, and then the road follows a loop around and then it eventually connects back with Highway 89. Yes, it appears so. It is difficult to see in this picture, but again, if we had started about down here, there we are. This is probably the southern entrance, and then it loops, and then it comes back around here somewhere. I was coming from my office in Flagstaff, and so therefore I took the southern entrance. The body site is at about milepost 7 on the 545 road. I don't remember the speed limit, but I would guess it's something like 30, 45. So drive time for about 7 miles, I would, let's just go with 15 to 20 minutes maybe to get there. That does sound right. Um, and you observed a body. Describe how that body was situated when you got there. Sure. So when I got there, the body had been as it had been discovered. None of our officers had touched her um, or, or changed positions. And so therefore, she was lying face down. She was, her body was up against some shrubs or some small bushes. And I couldn't see her hands. I couldn't see her face. She was face down. I could immediately, I, something I immediately noticed was the way she was dressed. So I noticed that she was wearing a long dress and that she, her hair was up in a tight bun. Now we heard from de, uh, now Detective Luna, he was at the time Patrolman Luna, that uh, this area is just cinders on the ground. Is that your recollection? It is. And does that prevent uh, what could otherwise have been easy to identify footsteps in the area? Yes, so that's something I also noted on scene. Um, when, I, when I was walked in by Deputy Luna, and this is common when we respond to crime scenes, we try to take the same path in and out. Um, I was told that responding officers had walked the perimeter of the scene, which is also common, just to check for maybe other people in the area or any sort of danger to officers. So as we walked in, I noticed their footpath, but you can't see footprints because the rock, it's basically little rocks and so you'll see indents but not prints in it. All right. May I approach witness? You may. Yes, I do. Those photos that you took? Yes, I did take the photos on this scene. Showing uh, Sasha Cross's body, is that right? Yes. Move to admit 110 and then 112 through 115. No objection to you. Exhibits 110 and exhibits 112 through 115 are admitted. I publish. You may. So this is a photo that I took prior to the body being moved. As you can see, she's face down, and you can kind of see those foot indents I was discussing. Um, they're likely mine or maybe Deputy Luna's. We did walk up near the body 
and then walked back. And then uh, just the surrounding area of the forest. I did not know who she was. Later that night, maybe even early the next morning, we had learned that Sasha Krause had been reported missing. I learned about that case. I had seen a picture of her that was on the missing persons bulletin. So we suspected that it could be Sasha, but it wasn't officially identified to be Sasha until the, the autopsy, which was the following week. Yes, it is. Yes. So this is a photo I took, uh, sort of just a close up of the back of her head. You can see that her hood is not on her head, but more like laying on top of the back of her head. And you can see the bun that we've referenced and the clips that were in her hair. Yeah, like you said, it's difficult to see because the hairnet is what it sounds like a net, pretty much clear. And it's right over the, the round part, which was where the bun of her hair was. There. Right. This photo was taken by me after the death investigator from the medical examiner's office and I rolled the body over. I really didn't. Um, when I first saw her, I didn't know what we had, but as I stated already, I noticed how she was dressed. And to me, that didn't appear to be somebody who was out on a hike or something like that. So not until we rolled her over did I sus really suspect file play. This is a photo that I took of the midsection of her body, and the focus of the photo is her hands, which were bound by duct tape. Again, a photo I likely took, I can tell that it's probably dark in the photo. Later on, uh, the death investigator on scene took photos and then I took additional photos. So this is a close up of her hands. That word has been used even by investigators in my office. I would not call it unique um, because it's not the only tape out there with that pattern. The way I kind of described it during the, the investigation was patterned duct tape. Well, yes, yeah, so I did a simple Google search and I could see that it's sold many different places, but to clarify, we didn't actually find a physical roll of duct tape of this pattern in a store. Something you could order online. That's correct. So you mentioned you identified uh, the body as Sasha Krause's body. That was that came later, a couple days later after the autopsy. Um, once you discovered that it was Sasha Kraus, uh, what steps did you take to get more information about how she arrived there? Well, as I've mentioned, we did suspect that it could be Sasha based on the, the clothing match that night. Um, so that evening, and I, I want to say we wrapped up our on-scene investigation sometime around midnight, and San Juan County Sheriff's Office in New Mexico was contacted. They came out pretty much immediately. We met with them early the next morning 
and we sat down and had what we call a briefing with them. So they explained to me their investigation up until that point, which included sharing with us their case materials. So eventually I, came, I was in possession of their recorded interviews, their reports, that kind of thing. And up until this point, uh, were you made aware of any suspect that San Juan County had developed? I wouldn't use the word suspect. I think that they, it's fair to say they considered multiple investigative leads throughout the month that they had been working the case. And uh, one in particular that I spent extra time following up on was Samuel Kuhn at the time. But again, we would call him an investigative lead. All right. And there, at the time uh, the body was found, Sasha Cross's body was found, did San Juan County, was their case cold? How would you describe where they were? I would say yes, it had gone cold, meaning they had followed up on all the leads they had up until that point, and they were at a bit of a standstill until we found Sasha's body. How does it work when you have a, a sheriff's office in another jurisdiction? Do you just share information? Does one take the lead? How does that work? Well, we work together for the most part. Um, one does take lead. So at this point, because Sasha's body had been found in my county and we are investigating it as a homicide, I took lead. But I did continue to work with San Juan County Sheriff's Office. Uh, we were in pretty often communication with each other, specifically Detective Strang and I. And that part of the investigation included me going out to San Juan County and, and them showing me where Sasha had come from in person and that kind of thing. All right. Um, after, after her body was identified, was there a press release issued by the sheriff's office here? Yes. So the media had been following this case pretty closely, actually from the start of the investigation on January 18th. And once Sasha's body was found on February 22nd, the day after we found her, our office put out a press release to say that we had found a body in, in the approximate location of where she'd been found. And then San Juan County Sheriff's Office also put out a press release. And I don't recall if there's said it or if it was um, assumed by many to be Sasha Kraus. All right, that was the 22nd of February? Yes. Uh, the day after uh, her body was found, right? Right. Okay. Um, and then throughout the investigation, were you made aware that the defendant, Mark Gooch, had his car washed on the 23rd of February? Yes, I was. Not just washed, but detailed, is that right? Yes, the interior was detailed. Um, were you also made aware during the course of the investigation that he relocated a firearm on that same day? Yes, the 23rd, the day after that we put out that press release. All right. Talk to the jury about what you were doing over the next month uh, following the discovery of Sasha Cross's body. Okay. So, as I've kind of already explained, we, we met with San Juan County Sheriff's Office right away. So they were able to fill us in on their investigation up until that point. Um, I sort of began with looking at everything they had done, kind of a second set of eyes on everything they had done, to include watching interviews that they had conducted, reading reports, um, reviewing cell phone records. They had already got Sasha's cell phone records by that point, and really just familiarizing myself with the case. I personally had never heard of a Mennonite before, before this case. And so a lot of that time was also spent talking with Sasha's family or people that knew her so that I could sort of understand that culture and try to develop leads from all of the information that I was overviewing. During this time period, uh, did you get a lot of anonymous tips or tips from the public? Yes. Uh, so as I stated, this case was followed pretty closely by the media and that led to a lot of tips coming in. Um, when we receive a tip from the public, we, re we follow up on all of them. So I, that was part of my job as case agent was to receive tips from the public and then follow up on them. Give us a sense of how many tips and leads we're following up on at this time. I definitely don't have a number. Um, what I can say is most days that I came into my office, my voicemail light was on. So it was 
pretty constant at the beginning, at least, that we were receiving public tips. All right. We're talking about uh, the month of March now. Uh, you're well into the investigation, but uh, were you able to develop any leads at this point? And I guess not just leads, but suspects at this point. Sure. So I did investigate Samuel Kuhn further. And what I mean by that is I actually went as far as writing search warrants for his bank records, for his phone records and his wife's. And the reason for that, as we've heard, is because Samuel Kuhn had reported himself to be at the church around the time Sasha went missing. So naturally, we were going to look into him. Um, the, the, the records that I obtained on him didn't lead me any further. We did look at other leads. Uh, in cases like this, we will start with what I would call kind of the basics. We're going to look at the surrounding area. We're going to maybe investigate registered sex offenders in the area, for example, or anyone else that we had information that was at the community at the time. So, yes, there were many people that we looked into. All right. And did anything materialize into anything more than just a suspicion? No. Um, did you submit items of evidence to be tested as well during this time period? Yes. So throughout the entire investigation from January 18th all the way up until today, We've utilized four different labs in this case. There was a lot of evidence submitted up until the point we're discussing. San Juan County Sheriff's Office had submitted evidence to their lab, and then I had submitted evidence from, at that time, mostly things that had come from Sasha's body, uh, the duct tape and that kind of thing, to our DPS crime lab and then the FBI lab also. All right. Um, now, we've heard, obviously, uh, earlier in this case from Seb Dishman. Was that somebody that you consulted with early in the case? Yes. I can't recall when I, when I first reached out to ZX, um, but I reached out to them and I ended up getting in contact with Seb Dishman. He and I had multiple discussions on if cell phone technology could be utilized in this case, and we discussed what route I should take as far as what warrants to write and that kind of thing. You've identified uh, just a few moments ago that you had Sasha Krause's cell phone information. Did that say anything about her travel on or around uh, the time of her disappearance? Yes. <clears throat> so her records were able to kind of clue us in as to when she, specifically her device, but we assumed her device, her cell phone was on her, when she left the compound. So we could see her activity throughout that day, and then we were able to see that the device left the compound area and started traveling west. All right. You referred to the, the community lamp and light as a compound. Why did you use that word? It's just a word that I'm used to saying by now. A lot of the people that live there use that word. All right. Um, and uh, the cell phone information from Sasha, as we heard from Seb Dishman, indicates that she was traveling, assuming she had that device with her. Uh, to the west around 745 and beyond. Is that right? That's correct. All right. So in consultation with Mr. Dishman, did you determine that retrieving tower records or the data from the towers in that area would have been helpful? Yes. So the reason why San Juan County Sheriff's Office hadn't gone that route yet was because up until my involvement, they really only had two locations. They had where Sasha had gone missing from and the area of Four Corners where her phone left the network. So once I became involved, we then had that third location where she had been found. And that's when the idea came up to do what we call tower dumps in those three locations to see if there was any common devices. And we were talking about a tower, we're talking about a cell site, is that right? Yes. Okay. And uh, how many devices, unique devices, hit on all three of those towers? Just one. And whose was that? That was Mark Gooch's device. All right, now with that information, do you, did you obtain his cell phone record? Yes, so once we received the records from all of the cell phone companies for their towers, Seb and I worked on analyzing them, and that's when we had discovered there's only one device. Now the records don't tell us who owns that device, and that leads me to have to write additional search warrants. In this case, AT&T, that's the company that we found that common device on, their towers, 
provided me a phone number and an IMEI, which I know was brought up during Sev's testimony, uh, an international mobile equipment identity number. And so I have those two numbers. And so what I did next was I wrote a search warrant to AT&T for the subscriber information and phone records for that phone number. And then I also wrote a search warrant to Google for that IMEI number for subscriber information. All right. And we'll talk about the, the Google account as well. Um, but with regard to the cell phone records, when you receive those, uh, does it tell you content of text messages or just that text messages were sent, calls were sent, those types of things? So it depends on the phone company and some other things. Uh, we don't always get text message content in those records. In this case, we did. We didn't get all of the text message content, but some of it. And so when I received the initial records, I was able to see call logs, text message logs, some text message content, and then the NELOS, the network event location system location data. All right, and aside from, and we've heard from Mr. Dishman on this, but aside from the fact that he was identified in these locations, uh, was there anything about the content of text messages that to you as the detective seemed like a connection to Sasha Krauss? Yes. So I began looking through the, the records uh, to include the text message content. And I saw a few things that stood out to me, uh, a few examples, mention of Mennonites. Again, personally, I had never heard of a Mennonite. So to me, that seemed t interesting that somebody would be discussing that. And so I saw text message regarding Mennonites. I saw text messages somebody was asking the user of this phone for their identification and they sent it to them which was mark gooch so therefore i thought well it seems like it's mark gooch that uses this phone number um, i saw a text message as another example that said happy birthday mark so again leading me to believe it's mark gooch all right um did you identify any phone calls that the defendant made uh, on the day of sasha's disappearance i did there were multiple phone calls on January 18th of 2020. And who was he calling? There was one phone call in the morning. Um, I noticed just a short duration. I looked up that phone number and it looked to be maybe like a motorcycle store in Wisconsin that had called this phone. Um, otherwise, the only phone calls that day were between a number with which I later identified as Sam Gooch. All right, and did you follow up on Sam Gooch to determine if he was in that area as well? I did. I looked, once I saw that the two were communicating on the day of this crime, I looked into Sam Gooch by, one way was by writing a search warrant for his phone records. All right, we heard from Mr. Dishman about pattern of life. Was there anything about the, the number of phone calls and the length of the phone calls that the defendant made on that day that was different from other days in his history? Yes, so you, utilizing ZX technology, actually, the software Sev mentioned, we can actually kind of create visuals of the records. As, as we all saw, these records are kind of hard to read, just raw data. So we can see a chart, sort of, and we can see that Sam Gooch and Mark Gooch, they've talked on the phone before, but never this many times in one day, at least during the, the duration of the records that I had. All right. Uh, fair to say, though, that Sam Gooch was through your investigation, nowhere near New Mexico at the time of uh, Sasha's disappearance, is that right? That's right. Uh, give us a sense of when this consultation with Sev is happening and when you're receiving these records. What's the timeline? As I stated already, I don't recall when I first called Sev. Um, when we write these search warrants, depending on the phone company or depending on where we're serving a warrant to, they all take different times to respond, and it's definitely not quick. Typically, it could be a couple days, it could be a few weeks. So if I had began talking with Sev, let's say in March sometime, we identified that common device, I believe it was sometime around April 5th through 10th, sometime around then. Right, early April, so that's yes. the month and a half or so after the Sasha's body is recovered, is that right? Yes. Um, after identifying that person as a person of interest, or would you call it a suspect at that point? 
At this point, I would use the word suspect. All right. After identifying the defendant as a suspect in the case, uh, what other steps did you take to uh, find out what he was doing during that time period? So I've kind of already explained that we looked at the phone records in detail, especially to include the, the Nelos records, the location data. And what we did next, after finding out who Mark Gooch was, I learned that he was a airman at the Luke Air Force Base in, in Glendale. We contacted OSI. And just like how San Juan County in, in our office had communicated, uh, we all work together in law enforcement, of course. So they're in a different area. I don't work in Glendale called OSI. And pretty immediately, I went down to Glendale, Blue Air Force Base. We met with OSI. We provided them a briefing. And then uh, they helped to provide me documentation on Mark. I was shown where his dorm was located. I located his vehicle on base, that kind of stuff. And OSI, remind us what that stands for. It is the Office of Special Investigations for the Air Force. Uh, and what information did they provide you in the form of documentation about Mark Gooch? Initially, they provided me, I don't know, I don't know the names of the documents. They are typically military ling language. Um, they provided me with like his intro paperwork when he would have joined the military or moved to Luke Air Force Base, which includes all kinds of information on him. Um, anything from emergency contacts, family contacts, to his current um, address, his date of birth, that kind of stuff. They also provided me with the DBIDS report. Again, I'm sorry, I don't remember what that stands for, but it is it's basically the, the gate check-ins for the base. That's what, what I can recall right now. Okay. Um... Did, did, were you provided any surveillance footage from his comings and goings around the dormitory? Yes. So, and I don't, I don't recall when specifically that came into play, but we, of course, wanted security footage from the day of the, the suspected crime, which was January 18th. And then after reviewing the Mark's location data, believing that he had come home the 19th, we wanted security footage from that day. All right. Uh, you mentioned that paperwork from the military, kind of his uh, sign-up paperwork, introduction paperwork. Was there a signature line where he would sign as well? Yes, there was. All right. And we saw an image. I, I don't have it to project, but it's the, uh, the itemized receipt for the card detail. Do you recall that document? Yes, I do. And I believe it's 185 for the record if uh, the jury wants to review that. But there's a signature line at the bottom. Does that compared to the signature line on that military paperwork? Yes, so I'm the one who obtained that invoice from the car wash, and I noticed that signature. So once I re retrieved that, I compared it to the signature on his, his documentation. I'm, of course, not an expert when it comes to comparing signatures, but to me, they did look similar. All right, and then we, we referenced a DBIS report, and that just identified the entry into the, the base. Is that right? That's correct. Um, now, one thing that one question one could have in this investigation is uh, if the defendant actually had his cell phone during the time. Was there anything about checking into the security gate that gave you some assurance that he, in fact, had that device with him? Yes. So the gate check-in times corroborated the cell phone location data. So I know we talked about specific times before, but, for example, um, January 19th, the phone data shows that Mark's cell phone was basically coming into the base around 6.49 in the morning. And then just a few minutes later at 6.57 in the morning, Mark Gooch, which was in fact Mark Gooch due to the fact that he had to provide identification to go through that gate, came through. So that, along with some other examples, the times lined up that it was in fact Mark Gooch who was in possession of that phone. All right. Um, you, you talked about OSI and uh, communication with them. Did you work with them to uh, secure an interview with the defendant? I did. All right. When did that happen? The interview was conducted on April 21st, 2020, and that was at Luke Air Force Base. And we heard from uh, George Letty. He, he testified earlier in the case that he helped facilitate that and actually got him to the interview room. 
Uh, when the defendant uh, arrived, did he agree to talk to you? Yes, he did. All right. And describe the, the circumstance of that interview. Where were you? Where was the interview and uh, who was in the interview room? Okay. So OSI has their own building on Luke Air Force Base where they conduct their daily operations, and that includes an interview room. Uh, most police stations like ours have those. So it's just a small room. You might have seen something like that on TV where it's usually two chairs, a table, and a camera system. And in this case, that's what I utilized. I used their interview room, and during the interview, it was just Mark and I in the room. Yes, I do. What is it? This is the recording of my interview with Mark Gooch. Is that audio and video recorded? Yes, it was. Now tell us a little bit about the problems with the audio in that room. Sure. So for whatever reason, right when I went to go do the interview, the audio wasn't working on the video cameras. So basically all we did was I have an audio recorder. I actually bring that into all interviews uh, just in case. But I brought in my audio recorder. I actually wore a body-worn camera also, just in case, for um, audio recording. And then the camera is visually recorded, but they did not pick up audio. All right. So Exhibit 37 is kind of a conglomeration of, of the audio that you took, as well as body camera and the different perspectives from that room. Is that right? That's right. I think there were two different cameras in the room, so you'll see different angles. And it's basically an overlay of the audio that I recorded onto the video. Mr. Barker, you may proceed. You okay, Dahlia? All right. Just once again uh, to admit Exhibit 37. Any objection? No. 37 is admitted. All right. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, counsel for both parties has asked me to read you the following uh, instruction. Some of the exhibits that have been admitted into evidence have had portions deleted from them for legal reasons. Do not concern yourselves with the reasons why some portions of the exhibits have been deleted. Do not speculate upon what the deleted portions might or might not reveal. Mr. Barker. Thank you. May I publish uh, Exhibit 37? You may. Oh, and actually, can I ask a question while you're getting ready to do that? Um, since the exhibit's admitted, would it be all right if my, our court reporter, Dahlia, could be excused from reporting what we hear on the um, exhibit? I think that's only fair. Mr. Griffin? All right.
Sorry for the delay. I'm not sure why it's not connecting right now. Do you, do you want the assistance of IT, our IT person? Um, we'll just uh, think, because he could well be over at City Court. Right, right now we have one. I want. He's a busy IT person, let's just say that. Covers a lot of courts. And so, and his office happens to be right outside um, our office area. So we'll see if he's bailed, just in case it would be of assistance. Things happen. This is Jared, who is a wonderful um, Coconino County and City of Flagstaff employee that handles IT needs for actually all the courts in Coconino County. They're doing that. I know um, it's not quite 15 minutes to noon. We'll see how far we can get. But don't worry, you're going to get your lunch break from 12 to close to 1:30. I'll leave it up to you if you'd like to use the time right now to um, I think what you're proposing is asking the detective additional questions and then we this can be worked on over the lunch hour um, to, sure We, as I said at the outset of this trial, we really try to be uh, conscientious <clears throat> with your time. We don't like to keep you waiting. And I've explained sometimes things can happen that are, can, um, you know, in this case, out of our control. So I've just talked to the attorneys, and we're just so close to the lunch hour. It's 1147. We'll work on it. The, they'll work on uh, uh, Jared, our IT. He's more than an IT person. I forget his exact title after all these many, many years. I should know. But Jared will, Jared will uh, work with uh, the um, council, council for the state and uh, see if they can get this uh, able to play for you after the lunch hour. So I'm gonna go, we're going to go ahead and, and let you go a little early to lunch, okay? So remember the admonition. Um, do not talk to anyone about the case. Do not let anyone talk to you about it. That includes each other. 
Uh, please keep an open mind about the case and please do not form any opinions about the case. Enjoy the lunch hour. If you could be back in the jury room, uh, ready to go, I would say ready to go by uh, 1.20, because what I'd like to do is call for you, if it's possible, maybe even call for you at 1.27. Maybe we can get you right in here at 1.30 or certainly very close to it. All right, enjoy the lunch hour. We stand in recess. All right, please be seated. So, um, Drew's been excused for the morning recess. Let me make a record. Um, we did it on the record, uh, sidebar, but I want the clerk of the clerk, Brooke, to know what we're doing as well. So, um, counsel and I spoke, um, sidebar, again, on the record, that the state, and, and counsel, you can supplement the record in any way that you wish, but that that uh, state was having trouble today. Um, it, the formatting of this particular video um, to get it to play on the disc that it was put on, marked uh, for trial. And so what, what Mr. Barker proposed, and there was no objection by Mr. Griffin, that he just played today um, the video and it's gonna stop um, before the uh, defendant invokes, and just and play that for the play that for the jury today, and then uh, there was an agreement again uh, by counsel for both parties that Mr. Barker's office will then get the video um, that is shown to the jury, then put on another disc, and we were we're going to substitute out. I was a little concerned. We talked about it, and this happens sometimes. Um, with technology, I, we talked about marking the, 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 the next exhibit, 37A. I don't wanna draw attention and have the jury wonder, well, we heard 37 was omitted, so why don't we have 37 and why do we have 37A? So counsel and I agreed that we'll work with the clerk and it'll be substituted out so that what was marked today uh, or, and admitted will be given back to the state and that'll be substituted with a new 37 That'll be completely consistent with what the jury has shown during this trial. We'll, we'll look at that together and make sure it happens in that fashion. W let me say this, let's do this. Let me add one caveat. What is marked today as 37, um, could we for the record actually make that outside the presence of the jury 37A? Um, so at least we have a record of that? Or do you want not wanna do that? Because I just started getting a little leery of saying, I'm going to give it back to you. Because <laughs> I really shouldn't be doing that when it's, once it's been marked, let alone admitted. So get, would you be okay with that? That right now the jury has heard it's 37. But for purposes of our record and any appeal that could, that could occur is that we're going to actually mark it today as 37A. And we're going to get a new 37 uh, that's going to be completely consistent with what the jury's shown today. That's Would there be an agreement to that, counsel? Yes. Okay, all right. Brooke, we'll work on that with counsel later. Once, once uh, the state gives us what I'm gonna refer to as the new 37. Okay, and then I think there was something else counsel wanted to discuss. Uh, Judge, I had raised, um, I had raised in chambers off the, uh, maybe it was off the record, I can't remember. Um, it was on the record. On the record, thank you. Um, there are two experts that deal with the area of ballistics. The state has an expert, uh, is Pelosi, P-L-O-Z-A, Pelosa. Um, my understanding is she's slated to testify tomorrow morning. We have an expert, uh, Mr. Warren, um, who's flown in from uh, Tennessee, and he's here. He made a request of me, um, uh, I think in his jurisdiction it's more, perhaps more common or common that um, he sit in to listen to the testimony of the state's expert. Um, 
we, uh, we would propose allowing him to do that by simply listening to the feed. He doesn't need to be in the courtroom. The authority on the issue is, of course, Rule 615 of the Arizona Rules of Evidence. Um, I don't know whether the court has, uh, has had this request before. I don't know whether counsel's had it before. I raised it to Mr. Um, Mr. Barker, and I'll let him respond. But Rule 615 provides, it's the, it's the rule equivalent of ARCP 9, and it is the, the rule that talks about exclusion of witnesses. 615 just mirrors the language of Rule uh, of ARCP 9. 615 reads, at a party's request, court must order witnesses excluded so that they cannot hear other witnesses' testimony, or the court may do so on its own, on its own. But this rule does not authorize excluding, and then there's A, B, C, and D. Subsection C reads, a person whose presence a party shows to be essential to presenting the party's claim or defense. Oftentimes, uh, in, say, medical malpractice cases, those kinds of things, experts are deemed essential um, and they're allowed to, to then uh, avoid the application of 615 or Rule 9. The case on point um, is Spring v. Uh, Bradford. That's a 2017 Arizona Supreme Court case. That's 243 ARIZ 167. Um, it's really quite uh, specific in, in, in the test that the court applies to determine essentiality. In, in spring, that was a case where, uh, unfortunately, defense counsel, um, after the state's expert testified, had transcripts of the testimony prepared and gave them to their expert without court permission. And this was an analysis of whether that was error and to what extent it was error. It was clearly error. There is no way to do this without getting the court to um, make this determination under the exception of subsection C. Um, but the language of the court's helpful because it says the rule does not di di uh, differentiate between types of witnesses. The rule applies to both expert and fact witnesses. Um, and the essential component is commented on by the court where it says that it's not automatic that any expert would be deemed essential. And then it says, uh, and I'll uh, read the operative language, Again, expert witnesses are not automatically exempt from the general rule of exclusion in 615. Um, and then it goes on to say, and the, as the Court of Appeals correctly observed elsewhere in its opinion, before a trial court exempts a witness from the general rule of exclusion under 615C, the party requesting the exemption must make a fair showing that the expert witness is, re, is in fact required for management of the case. So that's the test. And so my request to you is to find that Mr. Warren would be essential uh, to, a, uh, to our being able to manage the case uh, and present the case. The reason why um, it's often allowed is that it allows the expert to hone in on the differences of opinion between the two experts on the areas that are important and then it enables the parties to more effectively um, identify the claim and pre present the defense. I'm not asking to have unilateral authority to do this. I'm asking that both experts be able to sit in on each other. Thank you. On each other? Yes. That was where I was, I was wondering. Uh, I was going to ask a question, but I was going to wait and see what Mr. Barker says. Um, did, I'm sorry, anything further? OK, Mr. Barker. Thank you. Uh, Your Honor, the state objects to this. Um, he is not essential to the defense's case. When you look at the language, uh, the defense has the burden here to establish that the expert is required for the management of the case. Nothing about his testimony or his uh, retention in this case is for the management of the case. It's simply an issue of uh, whether the gun in question fired the bullet in question. Um, it's a very specific uh, part of this case, not for the management of any case. Um, so the state objects under Rule 615 um, regarding the defendant's uh, or the defense's I guess proposal that both experts watch each other's. Um, the, the problem is the defense has retained this expert. He's he's being paid to be here. Uh, our expert works for the state of Arizona. Has another subpoena in another court. I'm not I'm not sure that she'll even be able to stay and and watch the defense expert and be able to respond to any claim he makes. He's already reviewed what she's done, her lab work, um, so he knows what what her testimony is going to be about. Um, so I don't see why him sitting in on her testimony should be allowed. Thank you. 
Well, Mr. Barker, subsection uh, C of Rule 615 says, well, so the rule says, but this rule does not authorize excluding. And then under subsection C that Mr. Griffin cited to the court, it states a person whose presence a party shows to be essential in presenting the party's claim or defense. So it doesn't go to management of the case. It goes to uh, the defense argument that um, this testimony by the expert and his ability to observe the state's witness is essential to presenting the defendant's defense. Right, and I'm saying it's neither. It's not essential because he already knows what the state's expert has done in the case. So it's not essential that he be in here and, and or watch the feed. But the standard, and this is Spring v. Bradford, is that the defense has to make a fair showing that the expert witness, in fact, requ is required for the management of the case. So that's interpreting Rule 615. Uh, so we're looking beyond the rule. It's, it's actually more, there's more of a burden uh, to show that that person is essential to the case. And so I'm arguing that it's, it's, he's not essential for the defense's case to be, or his watching the testimony is not essential. And he's certainly not an expert that would be for the management of the case like you would see in a medical malpractice case, for instance. Mr. Griffin. Just, just briefly, by the, um, let, let me, uh, two things. Number one, uh, significance. Um, you have seen now the state with four or five expert witnesses come in and say they have nothing that links the case forensically to Mr. Gooch. It's a big deal. So this is the state's link to Mr. Gooch. They're going to claim through their expert that they have a match between the, um, the evidence bullet, what I, the bullet from the deceased, um, and Mr. And Mr. Gooch's uh, rifle. So it's a big deal. Our expert will say that's not the case. Um, in terms of the purpose behind Rule 615, so in terms of the significance in terms of presenting our claim or defense, this is, this is the issue from our perspective. This is the forensic link to Mr. Gooch that's missing. So having said that, it's a big deal. Number two, the point behind 615 or Rule 9 is so that a witness doesn't get um, to change their analysis um, after hearing someone else's testimony or change their position. Uh, Mr. Uh, Warren has looked at um, the presentation made by um, or the, uh, the work, the lab work done by Ms. Peloza. He's looked at her defense interview. Um, uh, we have made our uh, PowerPoint of Mr. Warren already available to the state. In fact, the parties have agreed uh, to, that it will be agreed that he can use that PowerPoint without laying additional foundation. And so there's no surprise here. Nobody's stealing anybody else's stuff. What we're able to do by this, why it's essential to, uh, to our assistance in the case, is it allows the experts to hone in on very differences they have and be able to more efficiently present that. So what I'm going to do is I want to have a chance to read the case that was just cited to me and this and this issue was just raised to me um, uh, at the last sidebar and then the argument right now. So over the lunch hour I'm going to read the case um, this, that uh, Mr. Griffin has cited to the court and I'll give you my ruling at um, 1.15. Or actually, no, I got to give my, wait a minute, <laughs> I'm looking over at Delia. Um, I'll give you the ruling at 120, so give a little bit longer lunch, but um, so if you can be back at, at 115, 120, and then I'll give you my ruling at 120. Thank you. Sorry. And Detective, I should have allowed you to step down while we were on that discussion. Sorry. All right, we stand in recess.